Today, we're looking at five different kinds of mazes that are used in psychology research. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, good to see you again. If you're new here, we talk about all things psychology, and when you subscribe to this channel, it will make your MRI more colorful. Guaranteed. What do you think of when you think of a maze? I tend to think of the ones that I got in those coloring and activity books I had when I was a kid. Yeah, you definitely have to be pretty crazy to get one of those as a grown-up. <laughs> as it turns out, mazes have been important for psychology research for over a hundred years. But not just any maze will do. Because they are pieces of scientific equipment that are meant to measure certain things, there are certain kinds of mazes that are used to answer certain questions. So today I'm going to share with you a few different kinds of mazes and what they're used for. The first kind of maze is something that we call a runway. It's just a long strip with walls on the sides and probably has a start area and a goal area. Sometimes the start and goal have little doors on them for better control of the start and end of a trial, but not always. Basically, you put an animal at the start and when it gets to the end of the runway, it gets rewarded. This is a very basic task to assess something called instrumental learning. Usually what you measure is how long it takes for the animal to traverse the runway or running speed. You can explore really basic questions like, does a larger reward result in faster running? Or will an animal stop running if I stop rewarding it? You can also do other tweaks to answer other questions like, can a rat learn that bright lights means reward and dim lights means no reward? If so, you would expect the animal to run slower when the lights are dim compared to when the lights are bright. Or you could compare two groups of rats and give one a drug and the other a placebo and see if the drug has any effect on how quickly they learn. And so on and so on. You'd be surprised at how useful a simple runway can be. Okay, we gotta stop for a second and address something. I can tell that you're really not satisfied. You were promised mazes and a runway is only a maze if you've got a big imagination. It's like asking if a hot dog is a sandwich or if a straw has one hole or two. Maybe technically it's a maze depending on your technical definition, but we want a real maze. Okay, I hear you. So let's move on to some real mazes. Now, if you've seen my recent video on turn alternation, you'll be familiar with our next example, the T-maze. A T-maze is very simple. It's two long runways put together to form the shape of the letter T. An animal can be placed at the bottom of the T at the beginning of a trial, and as it gets to the end of the runway, it has to make a choice, left or right. One choice leads to a reward, the other leads to certain doom. No, the other doesn't lead to anything. Uh, it's just an empty runway. Okay, so usually what you measure is whether or not they choose the correct path. That is, do they go down the path that's rewarded? This simple left-right discrimination can be used for all kinds of stuff, just like the runways, to see a change in behavior over time. Now, if you want to get really fancy, you could design an experiment where the animal had to remember what it did on the previous trial. So if it was rewarded for going left before, this time it would need to go right to get the reward. Now you can see whether an animal is smart enough to learn a rule like this. And if so, since this involves memory, you could test how long that memory lasts by increasing the amount of time between trials. Or sometimes, researchers have taken a bunch of these tea mazes and stuck them together to make one giant mega maze called a complex tea maze. Which is probably more like what you were thinking of when you saw this was going to be a maze video. <laughs> now that's a sexy maze. This is the kind of maze Edward Tolman used to study cognitive maps in mice. See our video on Tolman and the learning performance dichotomy for more details on using these bad boys. There are also variations on this theme used for similar purposes, such as the Y maze, which has less sharp turns, a plus maze, which has an extra runway at the top that can be closed off to become a T maze, or the I maze, which has a T shape on both the top and the bottom. But I consider all of these part really of the T maze family. Next on the list, let's talk about a really fun one, the radial arm maze. It's got a bunch of arms radiating out from a central hub. And typically there are at least eight arms which can be closed off or removed as needed. And usually this kind of maze is used for studies of short and long-term memory. So let's say you have eight arms and you bait four of them with food and leave the others empty. You take a rat and put it in the maze and it has to go around and find all of the food. 
Every day, the same four arms are baited with food and the rat gets another chance. Now, knowing which arms are baited each day requires retaining a memory over a long period of time, at least 24 hours. So if the rat goes into an arm that has never been baited, it's counted as an error in long-term memory. On the other hand, as the rat goes around, it eats the food in an arm, the food is gone, and it doesn't make sense to go back in that arm again today. So they have to keep track of which arms they have just visited, and revisiting a depleted arm can be counted as a short-term memory error. Once the task is learned, all kinds of interesting questions can be asked. If we lesion the hippocampus, which means we damage or deactivate that part of the brain, does it affect long-term memory, short-term memory, both, neither? Or maybe we turn on a gene that was previously inactive. Does that impact short or long-term memory? So we can start tracing the circuitry and the mechanisms of memory so that we can understand it better. Radial arm mazes can be made easier or harder by removing or adding more arms. And you can even look at attention by manipulating shapes or lights as cues, either inside the maze, called intramaze cues, or around the room outside the maze, which they call extramaze cues. They've even got human versions of the radial arm maze and virtual versions for humans as well. So if you're interested in memory and attention, this is a good one to get. This segment is brought to you by Alamo Radio Arm Mazes, Inc. Remember the baited arms. Time to get a little different. For number four, let's look at the Morris Water Maze. In this one, you take a plastic kiddie pool and you fill it with water. And then you put a non-toxic dye into the water to make it kind of milky white so you can't really see through it very well. You take a little platform that sits just below the surface of the water and put that somewhere in between the center and the walls of the pool. You take a mouse, you drop it into the water, and you watch him swim. Or better yet, film it from above. A lot of these mazes have cameras overhead so you can film it and then take measurements later. Early on, the mouse will tend to hug the walls of the pool, but it will eventually find the platform if it swims around long enough. Now you repeat this a few times, the mouse will learn to swim straight to the platform every time. Now you can measure how long it takes to find the platform, or how far it travels before it does, and so on. Now, why would you use this maze instead of a radial arm maze? Well, if you think about it, the mouse can only eat so much from the baited arms before it gets full. But the mouse will swim in the Morris maze to that platform over and over and over again, and it never gets satiated with too much platform. So you can run this test many, many times in a day. Usually what the mouse knows about the location of the platform is studied using something called a probe trial, a trial to probe or test what the mouse knows by removing the platform on that trial and measuring where the mouse goes. Sometimes they divide the pool into quadrants and when they analyze the video, they measure how much time they spend in the quadrant with the platform compared to the other three. Again, you can also study intra and extra maze cues. For example, imagine that there are shapes taped to the walls of the room. What would happen if you took one of those shapes and moved it around? Would the mouse go towards the shape that was nearest the platform or would it use some other method? How long does it take the mouse to learn the platform is at a new location if you move it? Because of its simplicity, lots of people who study spatial learning or attention use the Morris maze. Okay, I saved the craziest one for last the Elevated Plus Maze. The Elevated Plus Maze is used to study anxiety. Basically, it's a plus-shaped maze that sits on a pedestal and is raised several feet above the floor. Two of the four arms have walls. The other two are just open platforms. You can measure the number of entries into the open arms and the closed arms, or you can measure the amount of time spent in each arm, or maybe a percentage comparison of this much time in open versus this much time in closed. Now, a typical rat will spend the vast majority of its time in the alleys with the walls and very little time out on the platforms. On the other hand, if you give them an anti-anxiety drug, or anxiolytic, like Xanax or Valium, they will spend more time out on the platforms than a control group that received a placebo. Imagine now that we have a new drug and we want to see if it has an effect on anxiety. Well, we can test rats in the Elevated Plus maze to find out. Or maybe we want to find rats that are high anxiety and low anxiety and then compare their genetic code to find genes that predict anxiety disorder risk or something like that. Now, if you study anxiety, you're probably interested in the Elevated Plus maze 
or its sister, the elevated zero maze. The problem with the elevated plus maze is that there's that middle part of the maze, which is sort of a no man's land. And you can't be really sure if they're in an open arm or a closed arm at that point. The zero maze is shaped like an O and has walls in parts and no walls in other parts, but there's no middle part. So you can be sure pretty much about where they are at any given moment. Now I should mention that I have my reservations about the underlying assumption that increased percent of time in open arms means less anxiety. People tend to take this for granted, but what if you like still had high anxiety, but your drive to explore was increased by a drug or something? Wouldn't increased exploration give you the same results that reduced anxiety would? Shh. We're not supposed to talk about that. So there you have it, five mazes that are useful for psychology research and what they're used for. If you found this video amazing, hit that thumbs up button. Consider subscribing if you wanna know more about all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. Hello? Uh, I'll be out in a minute.